so cool to so basically what it is uh, this is for campus ambassadors uh, for uh, campus ambassadors dashboard and for them to claim uh, bounties on uh, tasks that they do and uh, some administrative task that uh jatin bhaiya and his team they can do like basically uh, pretty similar to uh, boss in its requirements actually uh, just like there somebody does some tasks and they claim some bounties etc so here uh, the tasks are mostly like uh, campus ambassador activities like uh, conducting a workshop or uh, conducting an event uh, or doing some publicity etc and uh, for that especially so uh, one thing we are doing is like a little bit of uh, analogy to uh, marvel superhero kind of thing because all the campus ambassadors are called superheroes so uh, like uh, all the uh, cas are basically called uh, superheroes so this dashboard is basically like a headquarter for the superheroes so that's why uh, that is uh, called wakanda uh, and uh, people who would be uh, managing uh, those things uh, like uh, the moderators and the admins of these uh, so they would be like uh, jatin bhai and team that would be like uh, shield agents so kind of that kind of a theme so that's how on the front end things will look like so just to give an idea about the models and relationships how it would uh, be uh ठीक है, so uh, first thing is uh, it's using uh, Nest as a backend framework. Uh, this uh, uh, is completely TypeScript based. Uh, so we'll just uh, get started with it, and that way we will understand not going through everything in documentation, but some things we will need that. And uh, for a uh, ORM, we are uh, using Type ORM. So although like SQL is more popular in Node.js, but Type ORM is also uh, pretty popular especially in uh, typescript based uh, projects so in an js uh, as per the documentation if you use uh, any database so they have uh, recommended uh, basically techniques databases so the primary recommended way is type orm although like sql is usage is also possible but uh, it, it will be much better if you use uh, type orm uh, Cool. Uh, let's get started with it. We need a NestJS CLI for this. So this is much like Ember CLI and Angular CLI and those kind of uh, CLI based generators. It can uh, generate a new app and it can generate uh, the internal components like controllers, modules, uh, routers, and all of those things. It can uh, typically generate. So we'll start off with the basic uh, project actually. Uh, Okay, so while that happens, let me just cover the uh, relationships once. Uh, so we will have uh, users, and we'll have uh, superheroes. Uh, we'll have agents. Uh, we'll have uh, tasks. We will have uh, bounties. We will have badges. So uh, users uh, will basically contain uh, a, a superhero object or an agent object, or it can contain both. So 
basically everybody who will be using this would be a user uh, it will be authenticated by one auth uh, if they are a campus ambassador then uh, there would be a uh, there would be a superhero object associated with that user as well uh, if they are a moderator then it would be an agent object associated with uh, them as well uh, why this is this kind of a relationship is because uh, so some person can be both superhero and agent so then uh, there would their user object will contain a superhero object as well as an agent object some people who are campus ambassadors at certain point they uh, you know get upgraded to like uh, they can uh, manage a group of superheroes uh, kind of things so i think we have sohail who was earlier a campus ambassador uh, he was superhero and now he is like a superhero moderator uh, so that kind of thing uh tasks uh, would be like the task that we said that they can do uh, and uh, then uh, there will be bounties that uh, they can uh, get when they get certain tasks so this one uh, i mean i'll just see maybe we can attach bounties as a uh, value to task itself uh, badges would be when there are certain achievements that are uh, made so there would be badges around that uh, so uh, we'll have like you know thor's hammer captain america uh, shield these kind of things would be badges so like super hero theme kind of stuff uh models make sense uh some i'm still not sure about uh, the, the relationship polymorph uh, polymorphic model so why not uh, why not is it uh, polymorphic and why just uh, being the profile uh, stuff like uh, let's say uh, an uh, superhero gets upgraded so we can just upgrade his uh, profile to agent and why are we keeping uh, his superhero profile as well uh, so technically like they they they, are, they would be both so they they can still do some superhero activities and still get like referral uh, bonus and all if they still refer people they will still have their campus ambassador id so if somebody's campus ambassador id is 52 so their mm-hmm. coupon is like cbca 052 cbcl052 that's their referral code so that stuff will still keep working and uh, if they are still in college they might uh, be still continuing so uh, i mean they are like a very senior superhero now they are mostly doing moderation activities but their uh, dashboard uh, they should still have access to it uh, like a superhero as, uh, also they should see their existing uh, referrals that they have done existing bounties that they have claimed like their position in the leaderboard should not immediately go away like that so it's, it will they will be, become like a dual role kind of a thing so uh, uh, there are some people who are only moderators they have never been superhero so for example uh, sneha ma'am is there and uh, mm-hmm. jatin bhaiya is there so they are like only agents they have never been superheroes but there are some superheroes who get upgraded to agent so then at that point they will continue to have both qualities so that's the reasons basically okay but so uh, the only thing uh, i am confused with is uh, if the super heroes are raising some bounties or uh, let's say they are claiming some bounties so uh, they are also agents and they'll be able to uh, you know uh, just approve uh, their own bounties so only those ones who are uh, uh, updated to that level yes mm-hmm. so not all super heroes will be agents also no so only mm-hmm. some of them like i think two three of them are uh, at uh, who were earlier super heroes and now they are at agent level makes sense cool ha so that's that's kind of like i think on github also like if you are admin then you can still merge your own pr uh, but that's only the admins who can do that and there will be one or two admins for the rest of them so like uh, you can use it like a user as well and as an admin as well when you are admin so you have both the powers kind of thing totally next we can have uh, we can have segregation upon the agent i guess uh, like for jatin bhai or this name we can have special uh, permission uh so yeah i think uh, we were thinking of that so we'll have some uh, so that thing will handle via i think uh, le- level of agent actually uh, so we will have like yeah, yeah. agent levels and like we will co- consider them as like some enums and if the agent level is like so like owner admin kind of uh, roles we will have among agents so if like owner level they can assign new agents as well and uh, like agent also like we'll have one or two levels so uh, that thing i mean once we create the models uh, those would be some columns we We'll have to figure out a little bit on the runtime, also getting the requirements uh, from their side. So the product is also like not 100% scoped out uh, right now because they might need is uh, some agents can add or remove uh, agents. Some agents might not have that power to do that, right? Uh, so uh, that way as well. 
um so yeah i think we will add those kind of fields into the agents object and uh, uh, do that that way so the user model will contain basic user related information like one auth id and uh, email id and avatar and all of those things uh the superhero object like if a user is a superhero then the superhero object within the user object that will contain uh the superhero related stuff like college uh, name and uh, their superhero id and all of those things and then the agent object will contain agent related properties if there are any uh, so uh, those kind of things would be there so that is like the uh, kind of initial uh, setup around this uh yeah so let's just uh, root i think it has uh, gotten started uh, uh, i think installation has done uh, yeah i think we'll do it once okay uh, so everything is actually installed i will just uh, copy the readme and all from the earlier one because i just created a readme with some logos and all uh, and a docs folder so i'll just uh, do that Uh, let me uh, actually uh, push this code till now so this we are creating is a complete back end front end separate solution uh, like front end we will create using uh, view or next or something like that uh, this will be purely api based in this back end currently the one that we are making in uh, next js uh see uh font size is this okay uh, is this visible mm -hmm. for Oh, I think uh, project got created in the application folder. Uh, sorry, just a second. Yeah, anyway, so uh, the source code for this is basically uh, it's uh, like very a uh, enterprise grade kind of setup actually. So when uh, initially it started, it contains a, a main.ts file. This file, I think, uh, during the lifetime of this project, we might probably not even uh, change it ever. Uh, so yeah. 
uh, there uh, th this just contains the starting up bootstrapping code and all if we have a config file or something that probably might come here later on uh, so there is a uh, controller uh, uh, dot spec files are all for testing uh, dot spec files are not de dev code they're all test code uh, so controller is basically like uh, kind of when we make normal uh, js based express code uh, so what we call uh, routes or routers that we call so that's what is uh, the controllers here uh, define that role so we create a controller class and uh, then we annotate uh, methods with get or post or put patch etc for uh, that method to be uh, uh, you know uh, app dot get or app dot post kind of a thing and uh, this uh, whatever this function returns that becomes the response uh, from this uh, particular uh, path uh, then uh, there is uh, uh, service so services are basically uh, uh, you know independent uh, bits of code which uh, can you know uh, like fetch data from a db or fetch data from another api or you know do any business logic so that stuff goes into services and then there is modules so modules are only there for grouping things together so modules are basically where we do the dependency injection part uh, so modules make sure that uh, a corresponding controller has the corresponding service uh, wired up together with it. So this is the root level. This is the app module. So all dependencies will finally flow through the app module. So basically we have a dependency graph will get created when we the project grows. Uh, so we'll just uh, see how that uh, works uh, one by one. Um, so now what we'll have is uh, Um, so uh, we can generate a new controllers and new modules and all of these uh, stuff, uh, something like this. So uh, it's kind of like Ember uh, pod structure. You guys might have seen in the front end apps that you have worked on. Uh, so we can create a, like the pod kind of thing. We can create a folder uh, called modules where we will have uh, one by one each uh, module. So we can create those using nest generate. So let's say we want to uh, generate a service for getting the users and all so we will do it like this uh, nest uh, generate uh, then uh, module uh, these are short forms are there or you can write nest uh, generate module uh, uh, users and i think uh, we can set up a folder uh, Yeah, so oh, I think an extra level of folder got it. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, we have this uh, user module. Uh, right now, the user module does not contain anything. We will just add a controller and a service and everything for the user's uh, module. So whenever we add a new module, that module automatically gets uh, injected to uh, the uh, app module or, uh, as well. So all the modules that we need to run in our uh, app, they need to be in the app module. Uh, we will just see when we make more than one module, uh, we'll just see one very beautiful thing is that inside the app module, whatever imports we remove, those routes, those services, everything will stop working. So our entire dependency, uh, uh, what depends on what that entire thing is controlled at the module files. So now if I add a you know service for uh, users, that would be uh, like this. Uh, Let's generate say uh, uh, service users and uh, Then let's say we have a controller for users. OK, so at this stage, what we'll have is we have uh, inside SRC modules uh, users. We have got a user module. Uh, we have got a user service. Uh, we have got a user controller. So this user controller, uh, it is uh, written the path is user. So which means anything inside this controller is in slash users uh, uh, path basically. And is the user service. So inside the user service, uh, just like we have the app service kind of a thing, we can create a function here. Uh, so uh, 
corresponding to you know uh, again uh, the basic express uh, and js kind of architecture that we use inside that what we call controllers there is actually service here and what we call routes there is actually controller here uh, is that uh, analogy being clear uh, i think we'll just write that down in sublime as well so like in mm, So what we call uh, routes here, those things are uh, controllers here. What we call controllers there, those things are basically uh, services uh, here. Make sense? Uh, so uh, maybe a very uh, forward question, but uh, what about uh, policies? So like uh, in our ExpressJS projects, what we have is we can just layer around uh, different middlewares and we can put in validators and policies then actually controllers uh, that handles the data. Good question, good question. So actually we can uh, generate those things as well. So Nest has uh, this thing called, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, if you look at the overview here, so what happens is like HTTP request comes, they go to the controller. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's basically what the root is doing. Then there are uh, providers. So providers are basically services are one kind of provider. There can be other kind of providers. So providers are places from where we get, uh, you know, uh, 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 data that we are getting. So services are one of the uh, most uh, common kind of providers, but there can be other kind of providers as well. Okay, so. Um, uh, that is what providers are. Then, uh, like you said, that there are middlewares, and uh, we can basically, uh, in like general case, middlewares we can create. In general, mm -hmm. middleware means any piece of function that runs uh, like before the controller is triggered, or uh, you know, uh, after the controller is triggered. Uh, those kind of things they are middlewares. That's like general purpose middleware. But uh, like for example, if you want a logging middleware, like you want to log all requests, so that's a general purpose middleware that you want across the app everywhere it's happening, and you get re request next all of the things you get. This is very express like. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for policies, as you were saying, for policies we can use pipes and guards actually. So uh, so the, the after middleware these things here, uh, you know. Uh, exception filter pipes guards interceptor these are all uh, very uh, special kinds of middlewares and there are uh, particular names for, for them so if you use a exception filter uh, an exception filter is uh, particularly created to generate exceptions uh, whenever a certain criteria does not match so for example you want to make some root forbidden you just generate a you know http forbidden status it will generate 500 403 or something like that so this is like wherever you want to generate exceptions you can use exception filters okay so that's uh, one kind of middleware one special kind of middleware like all of these middlewares, exception filters, pipes, guards, interceptor, they can be created using general middlewares as well. But if you want speciality, then there is exception filters. Okay, so when client side code comes, actually the filters uh, can uh, prevent the code from like uh, what you call is a fail first approach. Uh, you know, like mm -hmm. if it is not none and you return in the first line itself that kind of approach so exception filters are for that so that before our middleware is triggered before our uh, router is triggered all of those things happen we can generate some exceptions in certain places which will make our server faster because even before processing we are re rejecting certain things so that's what exception filters are for then there are pipes so uh, pipes are basically uh, you know uh, uh, those kind of uh, things that uh, you typically use a middleware for the common use case of middleware is that uh, you uh, transform the data that is coming like uh, if you mm -hmm. want to do encryption encoding kind of stuff uh, or you want to do validation kind of stuff okay okay so that, that's the i think the most common kind of middleware that we use uh, is uh, the pipes then there are guards so guards is where acl happens uh, so uh, guards mm -hmm. will have proper uh, acl level logic where you can uh, have a code which uh, is like more uh, uh, Booleanish kind of code, which will be like can activate, has admin power, like those kind of uh, yeah. co code will be in guards. So, uh, and then there is interceptors. Uh, so, interceptors are uh, again, I think uh, uh, they are a little uh, 
different kind of a coding concept like when you do heavy object oriented programming uh, so then uh, there are interceptors which are used with observables basically so that mm-hmm. is something we might not use in the current project uh, unless we use a lot of reactive code internally so uh, but yeah so uh, the middleware uh, like we can use uh, like the general middleware uh, class and uh, then we can create any kind of these middlewares like uh, exception filters pipes and guards these three are also middlewares only but i think mostly we will be using pipes and guards a lot uh, pipes totally. for validation and transformation and guards we will be using for acl uh, level stuff makes sense nice okay uh so uh that that's what uh, those things exist so i think uh, that probably clears that i think uh, yeah i mean we can actually write that stuff as well so in our express kind of projects uh, what we call them uh, policies so policies would be basically your guards and uh, what you I mean, common middleware that uh, you use uh, validation so, logging and yeah so middleware policy. stuff uh, so there is uh, common uh, middlewares as well for general purpose stuff but then there is specific stuff for uh, pipes as well and uh, exceptions as well so these three basically are what we generally use middlewares for so that is there uh, right so yeah so now in the user service let's say i create a, a code like here we will uh, finally uh, talk to some db level stuff but uh, what we do is let's say we do uh, get all users we create a function uh, which uh, right now let's say it returns a string it actually will not return a string uh, so so let me just return a constant right now uh like this okay or uh let's say we can make uh, mm, let me just close the project i think the auto complete and all is not working because so uh, let's just say we return an array of strings like you know user 1 user 2 like this i mean of we will change that in future but just to uh, get to the correct spec level stuff so this is a service which returns all users so here we will actually make a db call and return it and then uh, let's say uh, you know uh, uh, get user by id let's say we have a method and uh, get user by id uh, takes a user id of type uh, let's say integer type and uh, in that case uh, what we'll do is uh, again return right so let's say we have this uh, user service which uh, does these two things then in our controller we will uh, basically annotate with uh, get and uh, we will uh, write uh, get uh, user um, by id and uh, this will be uh, one of our functions uh, it, the names can actually be pretty much similar or uh, get user by id uh, which will return uh, string yeah so now uh, here we actually need to call the stuff from uh, user dot service right so for doing that what we'll do is we'll create a constructor and uh, like the app controller here we will uh, get the app service like this so this is uh, so something that is called dependency injection that is in the constructor we write that this item will come we don't actually construct an app service it will happen automatically when the app will start how it will happen that will happen because our user service has this annotation injectable it means user service can be constructed and it can be put into any controller if uh, needed so we will just write controller uh, and we'll create uh, let's say uh, user service 
and it will be of uh, user service uh, type. So here uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, return user service dot uh, you know uh, get user by ID. So uh, here is something I will need to look at the readme once how to uh, get parameters here in the root. Let me just quickly check it out. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so it's kind of like this. Uh, we write uh, get clone ID and then we generate the param like this. Then uh, there would be another uh, get function. Uh, so I think that should be before this uh, technically. So right now it looks like why do we have a service and a controller? Controller is basically just calling service level stuff, but uh, the agenda behind that is uh, the user service can be used in other controllers as well. So like if uh, the superhero controller also needs uh, to fetch users, then they can also use that. So basically making the code more uh, you know, uh, independent. So that's the major agenda here. Right now it's just wrapping over on top of that. So uh, this uh, method here, uh, the get uh, for get all users, uh, what that is doing is uh, handling. Uh, so if somebody makes a get request to slash users, so this is for that. And uh, this is basically if somebody makes a, you know, uh, get request to uh, slash users slash uh, ID. So that is going to be handled by this function. Uh, how is the base part coming? That's coming from here. Okay. And the rest of the part is formed inside the get function uh, parameter, I think. Okay. Uh, so then uh, we can uh, right now just run this and see if it uh, works or not. Uh, And really proper uh, logging also automatically comes. So it's pretty like enterprise level kind of way it has been uh, created. And uh, you can listen to the debugger also like basically open uh, this on Chrome, then the debugger would also be actually running there. Uh, anyway, so uh, this would be running on port 3000. Uh, that's the default port for Nest applications uh, here. So we'll go to 3000. Uh, slash users. So we get user one, user two like this. If I do user slash uh, two or something like that, or user slash five, six like that. So that part works. Uh, cool, I think clear till here. Makes sense. Just one thing uh, yeah. in uh, these uh, user service. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in the constructor part, what I'm not uh, able to understand is uh, why uh, where did we uh, got the this dot uh, user service part? Yeah, so like that is where uh, the dependency injection uh, framework is uh, working. I mean, uh, here dependency injection is uh, happening via a framework, not manually. Nest has its internal dependency injection framework. So what it does is that anywhere if I uh, write uh, injectable at the top of any class, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can uh, basically, I think, uh, let me see, uh, annotation and all is possible somewhere. Well, I think uh, I'll just see share code. Whiteboarding is possible, no? Yeah, yeah, here we go. Uh, 
okay so uh, this whiteboard is visible to everybody yeah, yeah. Okay. okay so let's say we have a class okay and this class uh, contains certain methods certain fields and all the thing is that this class can be constructed uh, using its uh, you know uh, constructor uh, let's just say i'm calling it ctor so its constructor can simply be called uh, you know it does not need anything here there is nothing that it needs like this constructor does not need anything okay simply you call the constructor and you can create a new object of this class okay uh, so there might be many such uh, classes okay uh, so these are uh, classes which uh, we call as uh, you know uh, uh, they are called uh, you know plain objects or like i mean th these classes don't need any other uh, uh, class object to uh, construct itself okay uh, so as you can see the uh, user uh, service class was like that the user service just contains some uh, getter functions it does not need anything else uh, to uh, construct itself okay uh, so these kind of classes now if you have uh, let's say another kind of a, a class let's just say uh, i have this uh, another type of class uh, which needs uh, you know it has some functions it has some fields and all it has those things in addition to that it has one field which is uh, of uh, this type and it has another field uh, which is of this type okay so we will have to construct an object of this type to uh, you know create this field we will have to construct an object of uh, this type to be able to uh, create this field right so if i write that this you know here if i write at the rate uh, injectable uh, thing if i write as an annotation on uh, this class okay and if i write that at the rate annotate uh, at the rate uh, injectable annotation on this uh, red classes these two uh, in that case what happens is uh, that the dependency injection framework knows that wherever we use objects of this class it will automatically construct and place them there okay uh so uh, what dependency injection means like it is shown like i mean i, I have been learning dependency injection uh, like initially when i first time studied it in android like long long back it felt very complex i did not understand and really put off by the concept and then i developed a lot of projects for i think 2 3 years uh, always trying to stay away from dependency injection because it felt like i don't understand what the concept is but the concept basically is that uh, you know uh, whenever you have a class uh, you will never construct an object of class x uh, in an object of class y uh, manually like inside uh, like for example if i consider this to be class x okay and say this to be class y and if i consider this to be class a so inside class a i will never call the constructor of x or i will never call the constructor of y okay, okay. Uh, so what will happen is that i will uh, either uh, create a function that uh, tells me how class x can be constructed or if class x does not need any further dependencies itself like in the current situation then uh, i will just annotate it with injectable which means i will tell them uh, tell that uh, this class can be injected wherever it is needed just construct it that's all you need okay mm -hmm. so wherever i need uh, an entity of x type and wherever i need an entity of y type i will just write the entity name i will write like private x uh, like that and private uh, y like that uh, in the constructor of a and uh, while a is getting constructed a dependency injection framework knows that oh x can be constructed very easily i will let me construct x and pull it uh, y can be constructed easily i will let me construct and then pull it. so you never actually manually call constructors uh, uh, like uh, because what happens is when you uh, look at a project at the uh, end goal what will happen is say you will have a server okay mm -hmm. this server has some uh, uh, you know roots which we are calling as controllers okay now these controllers are depending on some services so maybe this is a uh, the user root agent root uh, task root these kind of roots are there okay so let's say the user root depends on uh, superheroes and user services now this uh, task root depends on uh, you know this service as well as you know uh, some two three other services and then this uh, router also depends on this particular root and then uh, this root uh, this service and then uh, these other services so uh, we create you know uh, some more uh, things here like this okay so this is my server okay mm -hmm. uh, these are my controllers okay 
and uh, say these are my uh, service level stuff okay now what happens is like if you travel down the dependency chain maybe the services they use uh, uh, this thing db models okay they are using mm-hmm. uh, uh, what you call the sequelized model kind of classes that exist entity or model whatever we say orm classes they are using okay mm-hmm. uh, so uh, this layer uh, another layer below that those are our models so there won't be any layer below that because models don't depend on anything models are just data definition right totally so to create a server we need object of this type uh, uh, of uh, these types now uh, to create these objects we need objects of this type then to create these objects we need objects of this type so this is our dependency graph now if we can form the entire dependency graph before booting my server okay so that's what dependency in, uh, injection does is something called uh, inversion of control if you look at wikipedia page for dependency injection there is going to be a small uh, you know uh, segue into a different topic that is also written inside dependency injection is inversion of control inversion of control is basically when we think of uh, let's say even like creating a web page and we think of in a component way we start looking at it from the top of the tree we think what do i finally need because that's how users behave like mere ko to website chahiye so i i want to create a website okay then that website needs a header a footer then the header needs a title a title needs a font uh, and the text of it like that we start thinking we think of it in a very outside in way but if i have the entire picture in my mind in the beginning right uh then what will happen is uh, say uh, here uh, let's think of it in a more data data structure way uh, and dynamic programming way so when i am at this object okay when i am at this object uh, so at that point i will want to construct this object mm-hmm. then when i am at this object then also i will want to construct this object mm-hmm. right uh, so let me just uh, mark uh, this one as the red object and uh, this one as the say green object and this as the blue object right so when i am at object red and at object green i want to create an object of uh, blue type because both of them need it now either my programming skills are smart and i look forward and i understand that okay when i am constructing blue inside green that time blue is already there because red has constructed it so i will use the same object i can think of it that way and i will improve my efficiency of my project right but if i created my project from the bottom then blue object would already exist before red and green are created totally right so in that case we will not create blue when we are creating red and green we will just use the existing one totally so this is called uh, inversion of control we look at the project and we create the dependency graph right from the top till uh, to the grassroot level and then we realize okay so then we start creating things from the leaf nodes and then we start moving up so then what happens is lower level stuff that is needed in multiple places it does not get created in multiple places so what happens is now if i have another you know uh, b uh, class like this okay and that also needs x uh, for example it uh, has a private field of x type okay uh, which is of x type so now what will happen is that my dependency injection framework will utilize the same x object in a and b cool so basically okay. uh, breaking down into sub problems with memoization yes and then solving it from the sub problem level rather than solving it from the top okay. Cool. cool okay so that's essentially what is dependency injection now what happens is sometimes uh, what happens is i need a separate copy here and i need a separate copy here mm-hmm. i actually need a separate copy of x in both places sometimes that happens right which is true we we might want a uh, you know uh, fresh copy of x inside b and a fresh copy of x inside a so in that case uh, we can uh, have other uh, annotations as well so if we annotate it with i think there is an annotation called uh, singleton s uh, sorry uh, my uh, so if we make it a singleton then uh, the uh, this object and this object they will be the same if i don't mark it as singleton then both of them will be different so singleton objects are those which will be constructed only once and the same entity will be used everywhere if you don't mark it with singleton then so you can create basically scopes uh, so uh, we can say that you know user service uh, if uh, the user service of same scope is required in multiple places we will use the same 
uh, entity that has already been constructed once. So uh, like that. So for example, we might need a uh, say uh, logging service. Now mm -hmm. logging service we need for logging out uh, the whenever request comes to our pipes and guards and all we want to log those. So we have a logging service. Now suppose it happens is that we have two logging services. One is a, a console logger which logs into console and another is a sentry logger which logs to sentry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, what happens is maybe we need two sentry loggers. Uh, just uh, I'm just giving an example. Maybe one part of the application we want to log into a different sentry project, and one part of the application we want to log into a different sentry project. Okay. So let's say X is our logger, and from A we want to log to a different sentry project. From B we want to log to a different sentry project. So then X we will not make a singleton, and we will make uh, two different scopes for X uh, for uh, for the scope of X uh, for the scope of A different X is constructed for scope of B different X is constructed. Uh, for console logger, we just need a single console logger for uh, let's say Y is console logger. So in that okay. case, uh, what happens is Y we can mark with singleton and then this one and this one same is getting created. Uh, like the same uh, object is getting created here as well as here. Cool. So that's what dependency injection is. Uh, so uh, coming back to the code, I think uh, huh. that probably gave a good uh, idea about uh, DI uh, and what inversion of control is. Uh, so I think Pulkit, uh, I think this probably clears your head also a little bit about dependency injection in context of how it is used in Android. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Already used it, but I think this probably clears the picture a bit as well. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's get back to the project. Uh, yeah. So uh, what happens is uh, if uh, so, uh, this I can mark as injectable because uh, this this service does not need any other special things to generate itself like these are simple getters okay. anybody can create uh, now in other uh, objects we can uh, inject it just by writing it in the uh, this thing uh, what you call uh, constructor if you write it in the constructor it is automatically injected okay so there are languages like java uh, inside which there are dependency injection frameworks which uh, need annotations here as well. Like you have to write uh, inject constructor so that uh, tells the compiler that you know inject everything that is injectable injected into the constructor like that. Uh, in JS and especially in SJS, the current scene it that is not needed. If anything is injectable, it will get injected automatically. Uh, let's look at the dist once actually. So if we look at the dist for users controller dot ts. So you will see user controller dot ts would be here. The user controller dot js. So here, uh, as you can oh. see, okay, yeah. So this dot user service it is coming into the constructor uh, 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 when the class is getting called, and uh, where is the class getting called? That would be called inside user module. So user module dot js here, as you can see. Uh, uh, wait a second. Uh, we'll look at the generated code actually uh, a little later. I think uh, we'll find out like mm -hmm. the user controller wherever it is called. Uh, so uh, I mean generated code will be like normal code that we write by hand. It will be uh, like the top down approach only. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, when we, uh, I mean we don't need to understand how the top down approach is properly working if we are using a dependency injection framework. 
uh, we just uh, tell what the dependencies are. So actually, uh, uh, Pulkit, if you uh, know the full form of dagger, actually dag dagger comes from uh, the word DAG, which is directed acyclic graph. So why directed acyclic graph is because uh, this uh, dependencies of the of all our uh, classes, uh, we create a DAG out of them, directed acyclic graph. So once we create a directed acyclic graph out of them, uh, then we can, uh, you know, uh, we can think of a directed acyclic graph like a tree only if uh, the top uh, the top layer has only one node. But in reality, the top layer also has like entry point is more than one. Uh, so the the whiteboard I was showing you that had only one entry point at the top, right? So if at the top there are more than one entry point, then it automatically becomes a directed acyclic graph. So in the directed acyclic graph, where the final arrows are ending. Uh, so from that point, construction starts and it goes one level up, up, up and like that. Uh, I have a uh, question actually. Does this uh, all these properties apply to other DI as well? Like uh, yes, yes, yes. DI, uh, DI, DI is a general or... computer science, uh, 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 you know, uh, theory that applies to all other uh, DI frameworks as well. So the syntax uh, changes a little bit here and there. But uh, most of it is like standardized as like, for example, even uh, Java also like there are a lot of implementations like this dagger and uh, uh, apart from dagger also there are uh, some of the like toothpick and all also exist. So proper DI framework, they all follow something called JSR 305, I think JSR 330 or JSR 305 or something like that, which is a standardization inside Java, like how uh, directed acyclic graphs are supposed to be uh, created and all. And all of that comes from the basic un understanding of uh, DI at a theoretical level. So uh, first of all, DI can happen only if it is a object oriented uh, concept that is where DI is mainly used. If it's functional, you just call the function. Like there is no concept of having dependency as such, right? Uh, but when you are using uh, object oriented programming, then it's basically uh, like it's a design pattern uh, in object oriented programming rather than being specific to Java or JavaScript or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, let uh, this I think we, we have the level where user uh, root is uh, working. Our service is working now. Uh, what we will do is uh, so. Let's take a look at what our tests are also and how the tests are running. So the test can be run as. Uh, so we have got uh, E2E tests and we have got, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, basic tests. So if I run uh, just test like this. So it runs the uh, you know controller level test and service level test and uh, so on and so on. Okay, uh, so one test would have actually failed. Now this test, uh, let's just read through the test part and understand why it has failed as well. So what is happening in the test that is failing is user dot controller dot spec dot ts uh, here. Uh, user controller spec dot ts. What's happening is inside this uh, inside this test. Uh, it is saying that service is not available uh, inside the user controller. Uh, why service is not available is because in the user controller, it tries to create a user controller. When it tries to create user controller, it needs to be able to find the user service. Now it's not able to find the user service uh, at the test, but at the app level, it is working because what's happening is that uh, at the app level, uh, we have the user module. Inside the user module, the provider is added. Okay, But inside the test module, this test module is a unit uh, testing module. This is only for testing the controller. But to test the controller, we need the uh, user service as well. So if I add the provider here in the test module, providers, I add a uh, uh, user service. And if I run the test again, so now you see all the tests are passing. Okay. So uh, like uh, wherever we are testing user controller, we also need to import the class for user service because while creating user controller, user service needs to be created. Now the module must know that the user service where it can create the class form. Uh, if it does not know, then it will not be able to create it. Okay. Uh, so here we can uh, define other tests. Uh, so for example, what kind of tests should we uh, define at what level? So our user service does these two things. We should define our user service test, uh, for example, like this. It uh, should uh, 
one user. For that, what we'll do? Expect service uh, dot. Uh, we will call get user by ID, and we'll call with say ten, and uh, then uh, we will edit uh, here uh, dot uh, to equal uh, user ten. Right, that's what it uh, is supposed to be. If I call get user by ID with ten, it should return user ten. Uh, that's my test. So. Uh, I think uh, Jatin, you will be understanding this that it is getting very easy to test the DB layer now because the DB layer is completely separate from the root layer. Totally, totally. So, so all our services we can have fully tested even if we don't want to write test for roots because root tests are they are going to be have to be written like end to end way proper mm. API call kind of way. If we don't want to do that, our service layer can still be 100% code covered. Totally. So this is uh, the error that we are facing in the Jaja API that uh, we are bound to write end to end uh, test as of now. We can't just yes because the API test. layer there we have created ah. it is in TS but it is created in the normal way. We have created ah. a controller ah. inside a controller. We have written all the code. So here we can yeah. do that uh, separately. So that's I think the biggest benefit here. We can write service level tests uh, very easily. So uh, this creates the user service. Okay. So now let's say uh, we, we want to have a similar thing. Let's say for uh, superheroes as well. So I'm just I will just generate the superhero uh, files just for the project structure's sake, and then we will start wiring up the type warm part of the things. Okay. Um, So uh, now if I want to generate uh, like uh, the correct order for uh, generating also is uh, one thing. Uh, so what happens is uh, let me show you. So if I want to generate, you know, uh, uh, the for uh, say superheroes. So first we should generate module. OK, so first we will generate. Uh, uh, so will uh, generation should be happening top down. Uh, so just keep this in mind. I think uh, the best way to keep it in mind is uh, we will generate top down. Uh, and uh, 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 like the reverse of uh, DI basically, like the way we think, like from the bottom, top to the tree. Why we will uh, generate top down? Uh, no notice this part, you will understand why we should generate top down. So when I write nest generate module uh, superheroes and uh, inside the modules folder basically. So the modules folder is actually uh, kind of like the pod folder we have in uh, Ember projects. Okay. So nest generate modules superheroes uh, when we do this. So see what happens. We have a superhero module uh, has been generated. OK, now look at the superhero module. There is nothing inside it. Uh, it is just annotated with module uh, uh, decorator and apart from it, nothing else exists. OK, now uh, top down way. What is the next thing we should generate? We should generate controller, right? So we will do uh, next generate uh, controller. For superheroes. Now, as soon as we generate the controller, you see the module code has gotten updated. See this? So similar to what Ember does. Similar to what Ember does. But if we did the other way around, then the transform would not have been applied. Like if we created the it first, then the module, then the transform would not have been applied. That's why I do it top down, then the transforms get applied automatically. Now then we will generate the uh, service. So the service is uh, one level below than controller. So we will uh, generate the service. So now the service gets added into module as well, and uh, I think it should get added to the controller test as well. Uh, oh, it has not gotten added here. So here one level we'll still have to add. Uh, so he, uh, just simply after generating, also if you run a test, no. So this is the best thing. If you run a test, one of the tests will fail. Mm, how superhero controller test? Oh, uh, uh, test of the constructor right. We don't have the constructor right now. So the moment we do that, so if you go to super, so I think uh, this is also like every change we do, we can run the test and we can always keep sure that uh, all the dependency injection is happening properly. So here, if we like add the constructor and uh,
so now the test will fail because uh, it will not know where to inject it from so it will fail uh, that's fine we'll controller test will add this provider here uh, that uh, we need provider uh, superhero service and uh, now the test will pass cool so yeah uh, also we are marking it as read only in typescript is because uh, this uh, variable is provided to us by the dependency injection framework we will not be overwriting like we will never write this dot superhero service equal to new superhero service that kind of code we will not write that's why we are marking it read only uh, the di ones wherever we are using them uh, so that's uh, so this basically gives us a like uh, a top level like a, a what the code structure would be uh, i'm not fleshing it out more i will move to you know uh, doing the type orm uh, setup part uh, just after this um, so Uh, let me do one thing uh, i think uh, the code i have pushed you guys can actually clone it and uh, see it once uh, i will just uh, take a water break myself as well uh, and i will resume after uh, five minutes uh, so that one recording will also not be too long actually it's already one hour so. yeah exactly so that's why uh, let's not make it uh, longer than that let's take a five minute break and then uh, we will do the type or impact so there will be a clear cut differentiation in the context as well like this was uh, till now was just nest js project structure setup then uh, wiring up the deep part uh, would be there so that would make sense also that way <laughs> 